Welcome to one more edition of Politics on Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. As you guys know, we've been covering a lot of the Russia-Ukraine issues right now. Today, we are honored to have the host of Black Diplomats Podcast, Foreign Affairs Journal. Uh, he's in Kiev right now, and he knows all there is to know about it. As you know, we brought Norman Solomon and a few other people here. But we have somebody in the field right now. Welcome to Politics Done Right. Terrell Germain Starr, how are you doing today? I'm good, brother. And by the way, um, I'm so excited about my painting, by the way. This is, uh, you know, this is a Black Ukrainian woman. I just want people to know that when it was commissioned, and uh, it was painted by a woman that's from Donetsk who was displaced out of Donetsk where the conflict is taking place. And now she is in Odessa, which is a Southern city on the Black Sea. I've named her Svet Kwisha, you know, Svetlana and Kisha, Svet right. Kwisha. You know what I'm saying? I just want to introduce y'all to, to her for those who, who are able, if you got the video and can see it, you know. Well, I, I tell you what, I'm going to make sure that it's it's seen. But before I even get started, you just got me into thinking. So we're going to talk about Russia and Ukraine right now. But I think what you've just brought to our audience is we've never thought we, we know that, that that everywhere have people of all of all ethnicities, etc. But for some reason, we have never at least I have never seen them display anyone of any other ethnicity in uh, in in Ukraine. So tell me, are there a lot of uh, people of color in Ukraine? Yes, and so I'm at, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking. I'll give break down why you don't see um, Black Ukrainian Ukrainians in coverage. And so Black Ukrainians, well, Black people were introduced into this region around the late 1700s through Catherine, you know, through the um, when Catherine the Great uh, ran the Russian Empire. And so uh -huh. they came through the Ottoman Empire. Okay. And so, and the reason why you saw that introduction of Black people into the uh, Russian Empire was because the Ottomans, again, they were a part of the slave trade. And so they were introduced kind of as quote unquote presents to Catherine the Great. And so they served in her court, you know, as servants, right? And so you will see, you know, there, there are historical documents that depict Black people in Catherine the Great's court. And so now in regards to the migration of those Black people and how they proliferated, you know, that research is still being discovered, but there are Black Ukrainians here. There's not a lot of census data because, you know, there, there, it's just simply not covered. So there are estimates that there are several thousand Black Ukrainians, which basically comes down to one Black parent and then one Ukrainian parent. Um, now there are African students here, they, they number in the tens of thousands, most of them are from Nigeria. And so they are just students, they studied and they graduate, but the ones who are native born, it can range anywhere from 5,000 to 15,000, you know, and they're all guestmates basically, but you don't see a lot of black Ukrainians in, 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 in reporting because you know, for example, I'm a correspondent here and I'm actually gonna be doing some coverage on black Ukrainians when you're a correspondent abroad, you essentially work as your own editor and it's your discretion of what you choose to report to your bosses as a story of importance. Now, if you're at the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, you name it, and you are a bureau chief, if you don't think that those people are of interest and you don't consider them a part of general society, then you're not going to prioritize them in your coverage. And so that's one of the primary reasons, I would say the primary reason why you don't see them is because foreign correspondents are not there and mainly because for foreign correspondents who don't look like us um, are not out there to prioritize our people. But you're right, brother, we, we're, we're everywhere. And my work here uh, will be to introduce those people uh, to, to audiences like yours. And I'm gonna be doing that in the next few weeks. You know, this morning when I saw you on MSNBC, I knew there was a reason why I needed to and I had to speak to you because again, I just got educated on that part of the world. So thank you so kindly. I'm probably going to go back to that a little bit later because uh, now I'm intrigued. Uh, now I, I, I asked you for an interview on one subject. It seems like we're going to have, if you have the time, we may have another yeah, five minutes. No problem. Great no, no, no to, to problem. go on another subject. But anyhow, let me ask you this. First of all, give us the genesis of the current Ukrainian, uh, Russian, NATO problem. Uh, in your words, because I've heard it in different forms. I am not sure what is accurate, what isn't. So please give us the proper narrative as you see it. Thank you very much. So here's the thing, everyone's going to point to 2014 
as the the genesis of this current conflict and that is correct and so russia created a and i literally mean created a a story that russian speakers were under attack so he literally illegally encroached into sovereign land and you know on this false premise that russian citizens were being attacked and were being abused and took over the luhansk and Dom and Donbass regions, which are in eastern Ukraine, and illegally annexed Crimea. Okay, and I'm going to break down why those regions are particularly important. And so you heard me earlier where I talked about Catherine the Great, and you know it's important to realize that Ukraine it was during the Soviet Union, which basically 1917 into 1991, Ukraine was considered the breadbasket mm -hmm. per se, right? And so this is a huge country. Uh, in Europe. And so in the land is very, very fertile, fertile. And so, you know, you had people, you had all kinds of people, including Jewish people who were expelled from Western Europe in the 12th and 13th century coming to Ukraine. And so, but also during the, um, you know, also during the SARS period, you have Russian, uh, ethnic Russians who came, who migrated to, you know, Ukraine uh, for job opportunities, et cetera, particularly in agriculture because of the land, it was easier to till, you know, and you can, you know, you can make money from it. And so they started populating, you know, Luhansk and Donbass regions hundreds of years ago, right? That's important context. Uh, and you had Crimea and, you know, several hundred years ago, it was majority Crimea and Tartar. You asked about ethnic diversity. Uh, Crimea and Tartars are their very unique ethnic group, right? And so, at first, you know, you had the um, the Greeks who, who 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 dominated, and then you had the uh, Ottoman Empire that dominated. Catherine the Great came in and took it, and I'm not going to say what year because it just it, it evades me right now because I don't want to be incorrect. But it, but just it's important to know that Catherine the Great, you know, conquered um, you know Crimea, and then slowly but surely that population in Crimea became less and less Crimean Tartar and became more and more um russian speaking and so crimean tartars you know they're, they're muslim right and so when you so so I'm, I'm giving you that important context because it goes back to why he wants this land and so he's basing it on this false premise it's not only a false premise but it's the idea that this was always our land mm -hmm. that's what he wants to do and so to make it simple just as you know uh, uh, pilgrims european pilgrims came over to the United States, you know, you have this mirage of the fact that they discovered America. What they right. did was came over and killed the in, in, indigenous population. Right. right. That that is what Russia did through its empire. It's no different, right? They came and murdered indigenous communities. They are an imperial, bloodthirsty, genocidal culture, just like America. Let's just keep that straight, right? And so, when you so so right so 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 these centuries long stories are deeply etched in people's minds here, right? And so, because it has a, it's a story about displacement, it's a story about, you know, reparations that they've never gotten. But anyway, going back to, so, but, but it definitely goes back to 2014. And now when you think about, uh, and I brought up colonialization, this is really important because during the Soviet period, there, you know, you had the former Warsaw Pact countries, you know, you have Poland, and then you had, you know, these countries in Central Europe, like Hungary, you had, Georgia. Uh, well, Georgia was at USSR, right? They were got gotcha. you. Yeah, USSR. Yes, correct. Part of the fifteen, right? Then you had to no, again, you know, but but listen, you're close. Don't worry, you know, you're close. But you're dealing with the Warsaw Pact country. That's Romania, you know, and then you have Bulgaria, right? Because those were the like you know th those were the countries that were satellites, right? And right. So the buffers. All the buffers, precisely. And so right. after the USSR USSR fell, they immediately went to NATO because they said we we've all experienced this russian colonialization and we were not culturally russian oriented we are not into this russian sphere of political influence they wanted to go more into the west and so after in the early 2000s and going into the late two, you know early 2010s you had basically one third of nato which was composed of these former warsaw pact in in and in, in ussr countries but including the baltic countries right and so the culture of NATO shifted when these countries came into it. And so I'm pretty sure you heard a lot of discourse about, you know, um, you know, um, people saying, hey, we do not want, you know, NATO is this imperial nation that's led by the United States. It's true to an extent, but it's, it's true, but it's complicated. 
And so once you decenter the United States and realize that these former Warsaw Pact and USSR countries were, um, you know, w w wanted to change, w wanted to join NATO simply because they did not have the military power to protect themselves. Right. Then it becomes less about America and more about these own countries wanting their own sovereignty. And so Ukraine is a part of that because basically they're like that one straggling country left behind as far as mm -hmm. the EU. Eastern European members are concerned. Like, come on, y'all. It's like, come on, man. You could do it. You could do it. You could do it. And so they're so they're like so so basically Ukraine is not under Article Five, which means that if you mess with all of us, you mess with one of us, you got all of us. So Ukraine is not in that position anymore, and Russia is pinpointing Ukraine because he realizes that this demo, this democratic nation, if 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 you have if you allow this to flourish then people in Russia are going to think, oh my God, we can do that too. Right. So, not, so, 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 so it's not so much a NATO thing because listen, if Putin cared about NATO, he would have attacked the NATO country, but Putin don't want that smoke. And he, and he, he don't want that smoke, right? And so what he's doing is he's bullying this country and using it as a chess piece to pressure, particularly Germany, right? Because Germany, what one thing people don't know, up until 1989, they, you know, Russia split that country in half. Right, Eastern right? Germany. Had, Eastern Germany, right? Because you had Angela Merkel who spoke from in Russia. Exactly. In right? fact, she right. she was under that domain. Absolutely. She was yeah, part yeah. of the USSR, yeah. Important context, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. So all this context, and I'm happy that I have the time to really break this down to you because all of this stuff matters. If you don't understand colonization, because that's the thing, going back to, 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 to Germany, they have their own fear. So people are like, man, Germany, a bunch of punks that the third. And it's like, okay, you can say that, but it's it, it's a little more complicated than that. But at any rate, Ukraine is it, it right now is a country where they definitely want they want EU membership, they want NATO membership, and they have a really legitimate reason um, besides Russia in order to justify being so because they are the most combat ready military in all of Europe, not necessarily most technologically advanced. But they're ready. But, but, they're, but they're more so than France, Germany, or, or any other country. I mean, you, you can rival their combat readiness to that of the United States. For, right. You know, for, for, for the wrong reasons, because we shouldn't be invading other countries. Well, that's a whole nother story, brother, we can have a conversation about, but we're talking about Ukraine now. But yeah, that's, that's a general synopsis. That, that, that is simply amazing, and I don't think, uh, you have heard this entire articulation on mainstream on the mainstream media and we are here yeah, just yeah. sitting down thinking it's you know uh, oh it's just the fight between nato and the united states and it, it's a it's a lot deeper than that it, it, it's extremely com it, brother this is so complex right very complex now you are in kiev uh, what is the attitude there now what's the feeling do people feel like i think the, the, the original belief was that since he is way on the eastern side, that he would have just taken, maybe come and taken the land, those lands that are in dispute right now. But now I understand that in Belarus, there are battalions there as well that could, that are probably a few hours away from Kiev, which presents a problem if that's his intent, correct? That's absolutely correct. So, so north of Kiev, you know, it's about two and a half hours away. And so literally, if you take a drive up, that's all it takes now. Belarus. To Belarus, yeah, exactly, yeah. to the north. And so, you know, keep in mind that Chernobyl is north of us, right? Oh, <laughs> so, yeah, oh God. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And I've been twice. And so those, you know, and they have the type of equipment that can handle the radiation to come through there. Because I've been to Chernobyl twice. Right. And, and, and I was actually going to go, I don't know if you know the brother Malcolm Nance, who's on, who's on MSNBC. Of course, I, Nance, yeah, the CIA guy, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so basically, he was going to. He was an NSA, um, NSA so guy. I'm, NSA, I'm sorry, yeah, NSA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's it, listen. It's, it's all good. It's the same to most of us, but it is NSA. But basically, um, he. We were supposed to go up to Chernobyl to, um, you know, to visit because he's never been. I've gone twice already. But, uh -huh. uh, but, but at any rate, um, they can make it through that zone. In a matter of you know, in, in a matter of days and fighting, and so what 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 the what what Malcolm Nance was saying, and his own assessment was that they after a few days of fighting, they can surround this the capital, but they're not going to take it. And the reason why they're not going to take it is that these people in 2014 during the Euromaidan, 
um, more than 100 people died and they faced down the state security services who shot at them and killed their fellow countrymen. I so remember that, that. yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. these are fighters, man. They're not going to just, they're, they're fight. three no, million no. of them. No, no, and, and so Malcolm, in, in this city alone, okay, and there's 40 plus million people in the country, and it's a huge, huge country. And so the way that Malcolm described it was, uh, this place will turn into the white Taliban. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, listen, listen, it sounds like, but, but, but it's real because every person that has a finger that works and they have access to a gun, is subject to shoot any Russian in boots and in military um, gear. In military gear. I mean, because yeah, because these people are extremely resilient. They're not going to be welcoming Russian with cookies and milk. That That's just for sure. Now, I'll tell you what they will do. What they will do is that um, they will take the entire, they could take the entirety of the Donetsk region. And as you know, that there are some uh, um, bomb, there, there are some bomb, Bomb shellings in uh, yeah. They, in, it, in today, Dallas. actually, they bombed an elementary school or something a couple days ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. And so, basically, what what, can, what could happen is that the Russian military could take the entirety of that region. Many people think that they have all of Donetsk, and that's not true. They uh -huh. have a nice chunk of it, but they don't have the entirety of it. So they can take that, and they can take um, maybe um, some other larger cities. And then they can come in from the south through the Black Sea and the Azov Sea. And basically what they can do is come from um, come from the Donetsk and then come from the Azov Sea from the south and kind of like bring in more position and come together, right? right. They could do that part. But as far as advancing further than that, that's going to be rough because it, simply put, they don't have enough soldiers. Right. They have to literally throw all their soldiers here because the Nazis came here and took over. They had double from my understanding, double the number of soldiers to take over this country. Russia doesn't have that type of, of, of manpower. In order right. to, they, would have to throw, they would have to leave their country entirely defenseless in order to, take to come and, and try to take something yeah. where people are going to fight them. Now, that's a pretty modern city, Kiev, right? Absolutely. It's just like being in, let's say, Houston or New York or Boston or yeah. one of those places. Yeah, yeah. Very, now, yeah very, um, very modern. Well, um, I, I'm glad I spoke to you because I, I want to, actually, I better back up because I spoke mm -hmm. to two other uh, people who follow the uh, Russia, uh, the Russia, Ukraine issue. And one of, uh, one of them, Norman Solomon, in fact, uh, another friend of mine, he said, well, you know, Egberto, think about if um, Russia put a whole fl a fleet in our Gulf and he put some people in the Canadian border and the Mexican border, how would we as the United States react? Now, before you answer, you came with a very important perspective to first note that both Russia and the United States are colonizers. So in effect is yeah. one colonizer versus another colonizer in, in this respect. Now, how do you measure what Norman Solomon said you know, I, I think what Norman wasn't trying to be pro-Russian. I think what Norman was doing is saying, practically speaking, Russia is scared to hell of NATO. Practically, yes, but actually no. Okay, okay. So let me bring okay, so let me bring up the practical. Look, and I argued this in an article in a recent article with foreign policy. If America was threatening to invade Mexico, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. And we were and we had 100,000 troops at their border. And we were constantly menacing them with takeover threats. I would have no problem with it. Mm -hmm. But that's but that's what I'm saying. Practically, if that were the case, that I, I would have no problem with it. And so it, it, it and, and that type of argument dangerously flows into the world about even though he did not intend it to be that way. And I'm going to explain why. Mm -hmm. Because let's go. Let's go to the actual actually happening is that NATO has no interest in militarily having a standoff with Russia because it's suicide. Mm -hmm. Okay, Russia is a nuclear power. Exactly. I'm glad you point that out. Yeah. They are the they they are a pure nuclear power. Remember when I said Russia doesn't want that smoke but NATO if it listen, America don't want that smoke either. They are right. a nuclear power. Now their conventional military 
doesn't stand a chance against it. It, 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 it would lose one on one versus NATO, right? Right. Um, but but from a nuclear standpoint, you don't want those problems from either side. And so the reality of it is very simple. Going back to why I gave you that earlier history and context. Right. The only reason why, listen, if Russia spent more time building up its own country, building up its own economy as opposed to threatening countries that no longer want to be a part of it, then they wouldn't have to worry about NATO, right? And so NATO is only attractive if you fear a Russian invasion or a Russian attack. Uh, and, and what they and what the what what these former Warsaw Pact countries and USSR countries see in Russia are three things that happen to a smart Russian. If you are a um, Boris Nemtsov, if you are a politician who is fighting for democratic freedoms, they just kill you and they'll kill you near the Kremlin, which is what happened to Boris Nemtsov, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you are somebody like Alexei Navalny, if they don't kill you- They lock you up. Prison, they lock you up. Now, if you are the guy that created the social media site contact here, which just means in contact in Russian, and it's basically the Russian Facebook, what they do is they tell you, give us your data, give it to us now, and you refuse, they just rush you out of the country, right? And so this guy, this very intelligent mind that could be of use to Russia is in the West. Right. Okay. So they, they scare you off. If they can't kill you, they imprison you, or they just flat out kill you. Those are the three things that happen. Now, if you're in Ukraine, do you really want to be a part of that? Because it, 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 it's really, does it come, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the co-founder of Google, who is a Russian, is in the United States. Right, right. So, and, 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 and so, uh, again, Brand. this is important. Yeah, but see, this is, yes, but see, this is important context because if you are thinking about NATO, right, NATO is a military alliance. And look, it has all these complications. And again, brother, if you bring me on the show, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a pro NATO person at all. And I can break down to you on a separate um, conversation about my views on defense. I think the <clears throat> American industrial complex needs to be completely dismantled. Um, I think our military budget is bloated. It needs to be cut significantly. I can give you a whole spill on that. But the thing about, but this is, but but that situation is not what we're talking about today. Right. You can't. You have and to that, keep that, apples and apples. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 So so basically, we need to keep focus going back to the person who who brought up this scenario of what if this and what if that. What's happening right now is that if Russia was not a threat to these other people's security, this wouldn't be an issue for Russia. And even if Ukraine did become a, a member of NATO. NATO serves no harm to Russia whatsoever, um, because the reality of it is a country that really is self-destructing anyway. It's mm -hmm. kind of like the Soviet Union, you know, with the way I tell people about the USSR. You know, let's just say if there was not this big diplomatic push by Ronald Reagan to really, you know, to really un un undo the USSR. If it didn't fall in 1991, it would have fallen in 2001, because it was economically unsustainable. Right? Right. It was a political unsustainable structure. And that's the same thing with Russia. Their population is dwindling every year. It's a country that covers more than a dozen time zones and it has roughly 150,000 people for a country that big, right? And America has three times the population. And so just, I mean, I'm just- With an economy the size of Italy. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You get what I'm saying? And so when you think about NATO, NATO isn't invested in, you know, in, in trying to destabilize this large country because again, they, they, they control so much of the energy market. Anything happens with Russia, you know, gas is a globally traded commodity. And so I mean, they export very little gas to the United States, but because it's a globally traded commodity, we are going to hit it at our gas pump. So it's not economically feasible or makes sense for NATO to want to have some military confrontation with Russia. It's not good for business. Right. Well, look, let me let me tell you, first of all, you've been extraordinarily enlightened, Mr. Starr. Let me ask you something. First of all, how long have you been in Kiev? Oh, listen, oh, man, I've been coming back and forth since 2009. And so I came here as a Fulbright grantee to take a, a lang you know, Russian language course. And then I did a, a photo project on Black Ukrainian. And so now um, I'm starting a couple of businesses. One business is a tourism business. Next summer, 2023, I plan on bringing 600 Americans here and groups, you know, in, in groups of 25 people. 
Mm -hmm. um, starting in the late spring of, of next year and going into the early fall, you know, in October of next year. And so um, I'm starting that business. The website is going to go up um, in April. Um, and then I have a clothing business here that's kind of like ethnic modern wear here. I would have to show you to, to really explain, but that's going to be coming up soon. But I've been here since January. I planned on uh, the beginning of January. I, I planned on staying for three weeks. I was supposedly January 31st, but given what's happening here, mm -hmm. I felt like my presence was needed to be on the ground. And also, listen, I have friends here who I love and care for, and, it's, and, and my love for the people I've grown to see here are, are, are far is, is deeper than friendship. And you know, I, I I would feel a little guilty if I stay if I left and I wasn't able to help and contribute and to be on the ground and provide knowledge to people like yourself, you know, I, I would, I'm much more useful to you being here in Ukraine and, and giving people on the ground analysis because of my knowledge and my experience. There are a few people who can give that analysis like I can and the stories that I'm going to be covering over the next few weeks won't happen. You know, they wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for me, particularly a black person who understands. Well, you know, and that, that is why I just love your perspective again, because what we get is a status quo, plutocratic type pers perspective whenever, you know, you get the standard reporters. That, and that is not to knock the, the yeah. standard reporters. I mean, I knock them enough for, for being <laughs> milk toast, okay? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. The, but but what we need to do is we have to have perspective. And like I said, when I heard you this morning, that's what I heard, perspective. Tell us a little bit about your podcast. Tell us a little bit about how people can get to you. Yeah, thank you very much. So my podcast is called Black Diplomats, and it's a podcast that focuses on the intersection of race and foreign policy. And I named it Black Diplomats because I want Black people, I don't care if you've never left the country, I want Black people to know that they are Black diplomats. And for my podcast, I purposely want people to say black, right? You know, hey, you're going to say black because I want people to associate black people with foreign policy. And so each week, you know, I primarily focus on Eastern Europe and Ukrainian and Russian politics, but I have people of color. Um, I have people who are local, who are indigenous, right? And so, yes, yeah, black diplomats. And so I have, a, I have the most diverse panel of experts talking about Russia, Ukraine, and Eastern Europe than any other podcast that you're going to see if you want to get to it. It's on all of the major podcast platforms. I encourage people to go to iTunes to give me a five-star rating because I do great content. And also on my Twitter, Russian underscore star with two R's. People can go and I have a you know ways in which people can contribute to my podcast because this is by myself. I don't have any support. I'm just doing this solo and I'm I really survive, I really focus and thrive off of people who are investing in the work that I do. Let me tell you, I am, first of all, very impressed. I want to thank you for giving me the, this uh, extended amount of time. I'm glad that we cut it from the 10 minutes that we were going to do right after the yeah, show yeah, to where yeah. we could have some time to spend together because I've learned a lot and I intend to have you uh, as much as I can on different yeah. issues because I can see that there's some there's a hell of an intersectionality here. Terrell Germain Star, also on Twitter at Russian underscore star, host of the Black Diplomats podcast. Please check him out. I'll have it all in the blog. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.